Good morning, good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're gonna give everybody time to continue to come into the session and we'll get started right at 1030. Happy Friday. Okay, so I see it's 1030. Um, the participant number, I think, oh, no, it's still going up. We'll give everybody a couple, few more seconds. It just jumped up a little bit. Still on the rise, Gabby. <laughs> You've got a great topic here. You've got a great topic, lots of interest. <laughs> Lots I'm excited to talk about it. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started because we want to give Gabby plenty of time. Uh, good morning and welcome to this session titled Tiered OER Professional Development, Bridging Gaps Between Adoption, Adaption, and Creation. Your presenter today is Ms. Gabby Hernandez, and Ms. Hernandez is an open education librarian at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. My name is Sherry Ransdell, and I'll be your session moderator. Before we begin, let me remind everyone that a survey will be sent out this afternoon after the conference ends. Please complete and submit the survey as your feedback is very important to the planning process for next year's conference. Also, live captioning will be provided uh, for all concurrent and plenary sessions, not just the network sessions. But to access the captioning, attendees do have to click the closed captioning button in the lower right, set, right hand side of their Zoom screen as captions will not appear automatically. Finally, uh, please post any questions you might have in the chat. I'll be moderating and uh, making sure that Ms. Hernandez uh, has time to address those. And so I think we're ready to begin. So I'm gonna pass it over to you, Gabby. Okay, sounds good. Thank you everybody so much for your time today and for joining us. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about tiered OER professional development and how I was able to talk to faculty on campus and try to bridge those gaps between adoption, adaption, and creation. So just a little background of OER at UTRGV. There we go. Um, so a brief background, our student population, our enrollment as a fall was 32,000. We have um, a 90% Hispanic population and 61% of our students are Pell eligible. And so this, I find this really unique because this allows us at UTRGV to really make a big impact when it comes to OER, both with student savings and our Pell eligible students, but also getting that 90% of our Hispanic population and having those voices and those point of views added into OER. So we just sit on a really unique population to just keep engaging with OER on all different types of levels on our campus. And a little bit about our, our textbook affordability project that we have started. It all began with a faculty fellow and our Dean of the Library who really pushed for OER and created a um, affordable textbook adoption grant pilot, which then kind of spiraled into um, hiring a scholarly communications librarian, which we had did not have prior to that. And then our affordable textbook adoption grant became not just a pilot, but it was fully implemented in fall 2019, and it continues to grow every semester, and we've been able to be successful each semester with that. We also joined Spark and the Open Education Network, um, and we're also became an OpenStax institu institutional partner in fall of 2020. 
And then with all of those things that happened, they were able to hire a full open education librarian, which is myself. I was able to work part time as the OER librarian for a year. And then we were able to transition my position full time starting um, this past November. And then with all of that support with our faculty fellow, the Dean of the Library, our scholarly communications librarian, myself and other partners on campus, we're able to really facilitate more grants, faculty recognition programs, and then of course, professional development. So my purpose and reasoning behind creating a tiered professional development series on campus was one, I really wanted to show the breadth and width of the possibilities OER offers. I know we talk a lot about student savings, but OER can and is so much more than just student savings. And so I wanted to bridge those gaps in faculty minds of what is OER all the way to how you can publish and create and remix and all of those wonderful things and fill in the gaps in between those two processes of learning and then implementing those higher level, um, those higher level things that OER gives us the ability to do. I also did this because I wanted to give a faculty survey without giving a faculty survey. I wanted to use the registration and the attendance and the feedback to kind of understand where my faculty were interested. Did I still need to talk more about OER in the beginning? Are they ready for higher level open pedagogical practice talk? Where was my faculty interest? And so that was my reasoning behind really creating this and then also making it a roadmap. So looking at the snapshot of interest and guiding where my professional development will happen in the future. So I created three different professional development um, sessions and they were all a part of a series. Now the faculty did not have to go sign up for the entire series. I really created it so that way they could pick and choose which session best fit their needs. Um, and none of this would have been possible without the help of our Center for Teaching Excellence. They were the ones who I partnered with so instead of doing professional development on my own through the library, I then I decided to partner with our Center for Teaching Excellence because they really are a wonderful hub of professional development on campus. And faculty members are used to reading their newsletters, are used to seeing what CTE is up to. That is the faculty norm. They go to CTE for professional development. So I went to CTE then to host my professional development. So more to really get the word out. And the three sessions I created was OER, OER 101, how to get started, very basic information, just the definition of OER and how to find it. The second session was OER adoption. So in my theory was they know about OER and they think they want OER, but what are those other things to consider before they say, yes, I'm going to use OER. So really talked about evaluating OER finding ancillary materials and course marking. And the last session that I did was OER adaption in open pedagogy. So really that higher level, where can you go with OER when it comes to teaching practices? So we talked about Creative Commons licensing um, and giving them open pedagogy ideas of how they can implement it in their course. And I wanna let you know that everything you see underlined in my presentation is linked. And in the spirit of being open and sharing in this uh, open conference, I have each of my sessions were recorded by the Center for Teaching Excellence and posted on their website. So their website is linked at the top and the first two sessions are already posted on their website. So I have them here. So if you're a faculty member joining me today and you're interested in any of these topics, you can view the session or if you're a librarian or a faculty advocate for OER and want to continue the conversation, I have these recorded so you can see kind of the wording I've used to speak to faculty and how faculty have responded um, to our sessions. But also, as I said, I'm also new in this and in the spirit of sharing and being open, I also welcome any feedback on how I can improve my sessions on campus as well. Um, the last one isn't linked because we did that for Open Education Week, and so they're still in the process, so give it a few more weeks and I'm sure it'll be posted. So to talk about each session in itself, OER 101, how to get started. 
Um, this was really the basic defining OER, giving a very clear definition of what OER is, clear and simple. Um, we talked about the benefits of adopting OER. So it was all of those student stories, that student impact, what do students need? Um, and then also talking about what faculty, how faculty can benefit from using OER. Um, I took them, I guided them through the LibGuide that I created, which is um, the library guide of all the information that I've collected and sent them through the link so they could actually physically see OpenStax and how to search for content. Um, I also took them through the Open Textbook Library and the new OER text repository. I also discussed current campus initiatives because my assumption was if they're just learning about OER, then I'm also going to assume they're just learning about the initiatives that were running on campus and I wanted to make sure that they're involved in that. So 39 people registered for this session, two of those were staff members, and in total I had 21 faculty members attend. So I was really, really excited about this. This is what I was expecting, a high number of registrants, a good number of attendees because this is just the broad introductory, you know, kind of getting their toes wet of what OER is. And as you can see, the title is also underlined because again, in the spirit of sharing and being open, I have linked all of my presentations. I created them in Canva. So if you click on these links, you will get, you will be taken to a template that you can then um, use and reuse. I have all of my presentations licensed CCBY. So that way I know that being an open education librarian full-time is not the norm. Um, many people who are advocating for OER on campus wear many different hats and do it just as a side piece. So I wanted to share this to you as kind of a basic or an outline for you to start and continue the conversations on your campus. Um, and you can modify it to fit the needs of your faculty. Um, so that was my first session. My second session was OER adoption. So we talked about, again, defining OER. I wanted to make sure that it was uh, very, very clear in every session how we were defining OER on campus um, and making it very clear. We also talked about backwards design and you know, letting faculty know that you know, choosing, figuring out what your course objectives were and figuring out how you were going to teach those objectives and then finding materials to fit those objectives, you know, uh, OER can help facilitate that process instead of the other way around where you're choosing a traditional textbook and then creating your course around that. Um, we talked about evaluating OER, which of course is exactly the same way you would evaluate any other resource, but you know, that free part is in there. And I talked a lot about it I talked about these things because I wanted to squish those myth busters and those misconceptions before they even started. I wanted to make sure I, I engaged faculty in these conversations before those thoughts popped into their head. Um, we also talked about ancillary materials and I was very honest. Um, we all know that there are a lot of ancillary materials for some OER and for others it's completely lacking. So I wanted faculty members to understand that before they decided to adopt, again, considerations on, you know, do I really, is this right for me or do I want to take it one step at a time and maybe not wholesale adopt an OER, but maybe adopt it just a module at a time so I can create those resources that aren't available yet. So I took them through OpenStax again to show them the ancillary materials as well as the open textbook library, which um, there are some ancillary materials attached to certain titles. So I showed them how to look to see if it was already ex in existence. And then I took them through the OER text repository again, but in a different light, I showed them how they can see certain that there's a whole group of materials that are peer reviewed. So talking about evaluating and knowing if these resources are valuable to them or who created them. Um, and then we talked about course marking in Texas because I wanted to make sure that faculty connected. If I'm gonna adopt OER, I need to make sure that, we, that I tell somebody so that way we can mark it properly in our course schedule in compliance with SB 810. Um, so the attendance to this, I had 29 people register and five staff members register. Those, that was a mix of instructional designers and librarians. 
And of that, I had 18 people attend and my one staff member was a librarian who attended this session. So I was expecting this. I was expecting as my sessions, um, as I kept going with my sessions that my attendance would get smaller and smaller. You know, the more focused um, the topic, the smaller the attendance, the more focused the group would be. So this I was expecting. Um, we still had a really, really great conversation and six faculty members showed up for their second session. So they uh, saw the first and the second. And my third session was then again, the highest level content of OER um, adaption and open pedagogy. So this session again was more about defining the flexibility of OER. So we know what it, we know that it's student savings and all of these things, but what else do those five R's mean? How flexible is it? And we talked about copyright and open licensing. And I wanted to make sure that my faculty members didn't fear open licensing or have any negative connotations associated with it. You know, letting them know that they work copyright and open licensing works in parallel, not instead of. And so we went through each of the Creative Commons licensing, talked about which ones were open and were not open. I um, tried my best to ensure that I'd never told them what to use, but just always offering options. Um, we talked about renewable assignments, open pedagogy, and active learning. So how different open pedagogical practices can um, kind of check off different learning environments in their course. And um, with the open pedagogy, I gave them two different examples. I gave them small ideas and how you could implement it maybe just as one assignment and then big ideas where the entire course was creating something new and the entire the entire course was centered around one giant open pedagogical project so um, i gave them options there so to ease themselves in or if they were ready to take that big step what it could look like in those ways now this session completely surprised me. I was not expecting 34 registrants nor 26 attendees. I was, honestly, I was expecting like, I'm gonna have like 10 people show up because this is a, uh, you know, a really unique topic. Um, but I was shocked and, and wonderful. It was so wonderful this session. And my three staff members that attended were all instructional designers. Um, so it's nice to know that not only are faculty interested in this, but also librarians and instructional designers on how they can continue the conversation. Um, I had three faculty members attend their second session with this one. So either the first and the third or the second and the third, and then four faculty who stuck with me the whole time and they watched all three sessions over a three month period. Um, and so it was really nice to know that um, they were engaged the entire um, throughout the entire process. So lessons learned. Um, in total, I had 83 registrants between all three sessions, which that number just blew me away. Um, I was very excited. I had 57 unique attendees and I made sure to reach out to non-attendees. So those who had registered but weren't able to come because as we all know, life happens. And I wanted to go ahead and give them the recordings just in case they were interested, but weren't able to make it that day. And I'm working on adoption tracking with um, a database that I've created through Airtable of keeping track of who came to which session. So that way I can reach out in the future to see if um, they're still interested in kind of just keeping those conversations happening. Um, interest, there's a, apparently a lot of interest on campus uh, surrounding OER at, on all levels, um, faculty, are interested in how this can impact their learning. And they're also very receptive. Um, they really do care. Faculty members kept telling me, this is important because my textbooks are too expensive. Students can't afford it. You know, Showing those demographics of our students, they really understand um, who is coming and attending UTRGV. And they wanna make a difference. Obviously 83 different faculty members are looking for alternatives to traditional textbooks and learning more about open, open practices. And I also learned more about who's publishing OER on campus. I found new faculty that I didn't know were wanting to publish open resources and um, you know that they're really interested in open pedagogy and wanting to take the next steps in open education. So, that I know that was fast and furious, but I wanted to leave um, some time for some questions. 
um, or comments, um, you can reach out to me anytime. Again, the link to the mod uh, to my presentation is in the chat as well as in the conference webpage. So feel free to use or view any of these resources. Um, again, at CCBY and share conversations both ways. If you see anything that I can add um, that maybe has worked on your campus, I am open ears and um, always wanting to learn. So thank you so much and feel free to put any questions you may have in the chat. Great job, Gabby. Um, we're getting a lot of good feedback, a lot of uh, chats thanking you for sharing and, and presenting. Uh, with detail, with clarity about your work. I did uh, drop a link to your handouts in the chat for everyone so they were able to Thank quickly you. get exactly to what you needed. I don't see any questions at this time. A um, lot of thanks. A couple of comments about um, great numbers that your your turnout was really, really great. Oh, we just got a, got a question. Okay, so. Um, oh, perfect. <laughs> We have someone that's asked, what is your university's policy on intellectual property? <sighs> Questions, I'm not sure. Um, that is, I would say, um, contact me and that way I can research that and um, we can have conversations directly so we can talk about that. Um, but I'm sorry, I, I don't know that policy off the top of my head and I probably should. So that will be something I put in my pocket and make sure I have for next time. Um, what kind of information did I share about open pedagogy? I shared um, lots and lots and lots of resources and lots of examples. So, and I also had them reflect. So after, so my first section was what can open pedagogy look like as an assignment? So, you know, doing worked problems. So in your math class, have your, you know, students do worked problems, have them solve it, and then use that to share um, in other semesters or make lecture video, uh, I mean, uh, topic introductory videos. So, you know, I related it to digital learning right now, that they're having to do that right now as a faculty member, but we all know that students learn best when they hear it presented in different ways and using different words. So they can have their students create these videos and then for the next semester, they can choose the best ones and have you know their own instructor introductory to a course as well as a student introductory to that same topic um, and use those um, for each module. So I talked about those little assignments that are very simple and can be implemented kind of one at a time. And then I gave them a ton of links to like the open pedagogy notebook um, and creating open textbooks with your students by Revis, that, um, that, by, that uh, OER, and showed them then how you could do a whole course of either adding to a current OER that's there or maybe taking I've heard of a, a engineering faculty who took a general engineering textbook and then focused it to his topic of engineering and have the students create it. So showed them again, the different levels of how you can engage with open pedagogy. And then I also had the faculty members reflect. So I said, think about what you're currently doing right now. And could any of those assignments you already do be turned into something that's an open pedagogy assignment? Um, and so that's kind of how I had I discussed that topic with my faculty. Um, let's see, what were the greatest challenges for your faculty in developing OER? Everyone talks about ancillary materials um, when it comes to adopting OER. With developing OER, um, they are looking for communities of practice. There, you know, has anybody done this that I can talk to? Or, um, you know, is there some sort of guidance? And so again, we're still new in our, in our prod and um, what am I saying? Um, our textbook afford affordability project is still new. And so we're trying to figure out how we're gonna take those next steps to support faculty in creation. Um, and so this was also a big part of it, knowing that we have so many faculty already interested in open pedagogy um, and creating materials that showing me we need to kind of get on the ball and start supporting faculty with those conversations of publishing. Um, 
And so that's kind of where we're going those next steps for our program. Um, So our reference research and instruction librarians, uh, currently we have our research and instruction librarians building, they use our um, research guides for faculty members. So that way when a new faculty member or a student needs to do research, they guide them to that page. And right now we're working together in a project where they're creating a new tab that's gonna be OER. So it's helping them as well, scaffolding them into this whole process of if they're searching for OER, then they better understand what it is and what's available so they can feel more confident having discussions with our faculty members about OER. So that's kind of how we're building um, and scaffolding our structure. So that's how our research and instruction librarians are kind of um, starting to involve themselves in this process as well. You know, I don't wanna ever make them you know, say y'all need to have these conversations, but they don't have um, the background or the research to be able to facilitate those conversations with ease. So that's how we are including them in this process. And other members of the library, we're working on it. Um, <laughs> we're working on doing professional development as well internal um, and to, you know, show them how OER kind of relates to each different department within the library. Um, so I did have a faculty member ask about the legal um, implications, um, especially when he talked about um, what does, um, oh, what is it, what does non-commercial actually mean? And again, I am not a Creative Commons expert. Um, I know the basics. And so what I did was I encouraged them to go through the Creative Commons um, they have their own um, professional development series where you can go and take that and learn all of the ins and outs of Creative Commons um, and really become an expert on those materials. And so I made sure to guide him to those resources. So that way um, I'm not saying something that may be wrong. So I gave him my opinion on what, how I view it, but you know, from further research, go uh, to take that Creative Commons course, which I've heard really great things about. Um, I think that I think you covered all the questions. Did I get all yeah. the questions? <laughs> and I think so. we're at our so. we're, we're at our, our time. Yeah, we and are thank you for all of those who thank you for all of those who put your email. I will get in contact with you after this, so we can continue to start conversations. And for all of you, thank you again for your time, and feel free to reach out. Um, I have my email address here. I'm always available. Great job, Gabby. Thank you. Thank you.